Well, welcome to Rare Classic Cars. We have my guest, Mark, again. Since the last 59 uh, review of the Chevrolet versus the Pontiac Parisienne went well, Mark and I are going to show two more of our vehicles. My 75 Olds Delta 88 Royale and his 76 Olds 98 Regency. And we are here in a very appropriate 70s setting with some very appropriate 1970s cars. That's right. That's right. So, and Mark has to do his disclosure at the beginning of the video. That's so. right. My disclosure, again, just for all of uh, those of you who don't know, I do work at General Motors currently. Adam used to work there, but uh, all of us are required by a company policy to disclose that we work there. So just in case people are going to tell me about your dad's 1977 Brougham that had a problem with the carburetor, I can't fix that for you. But just so and that you, you work know, for Oldsmobile Division, right? <laughs> I'm not that old. Thank you very much, Adam. Yes. You were born a few years after they went to the round wheel. I just a few years after that, yes. <laughs> So, well, glad to have Mark again. We're going to talk about uh, the vehicles themselves, a little bit of an overview, the design, some of the features, and then everything from the exterior to the interior to the powertrains. So, Mark, do you want to start talking about well, the I mean, we features can start. Here? We can start talking about what we have here in the sense of this is probably the beginning of the new age and the end of an era, so to speak, at the same time. And these were the last representatives of the big full-size Oldsmobile family car luxury before things were taking a decidedly different turn, right? So that's right. Um, we have yours the, is the last year, and mine is this is the last, last year. year. And the 1976 was interesting in the sense that this was the biggest in terms of physical size ever, and also the biggest in terms of powertrain displacement that these cars ever got. And after that, 1977 was, of course, the first year of the very successful downsize, which you've done uh, a segment on because you have that 77 uh, Chevy Impala. Yes. And uh, I think this uh, Royale, this Delta uh, 88 Royale, represents probably sort of the twilight of Oldsmobile full-size family cars because when this car was on the market or came to the market, the, it had already been a little bit past its prime, its peak, and the sales for these cars were dropping off. They were no longer the mainstay. Yeah, this one uh, only sold showroom. about 25,000 exactly. units or so. Exactly, and, the, not and much. the action for Oldsmobile was all in the Cutlass already at that, at that point in time, and the Cutlass was beginning to shape up uh, in terms of becoming America's best-selling nameplate, actually, in the, in the mid-70s. 1976, I believe, actually was the year that the Cutlass was America's uh, best-selling model of anything. Which is humorous to think of that as an intermediate, uh, if you will, too. Well, but in the context correct. of this being a full-size car, it certainly And they is. are certainly full-size. They are the fullest full-size cars <laughs> that were ever true. made. Well, yours is, yours is even more full-size because this is a 127-inch wheelbase. Correct. Real base. That's the big one. That's the C-body big this one. This is 124. Yeah. Yeah. So Cadillac was 130, I think, for the DeVilles, 133 yeah. for the Fleetwood. Yes. Chevrolet was still 121 and a half, and Pontiac had dropped. If you remember, in the early 70s, they had the Granville, and in 71, 72, uh, they had the Granville and the Bonneville on the 126-inch wheelbase. By 73, they had gone to the 124 for the Catalina and the Bonneville. Details. These cars are nearly 20 feet long. Yes. That's all that matters. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> they're, they're big in any form, right? They're big in any form, and they have about the side, the length of a stretch wheelbase Suburban or something like this. I mean, they are uh, bigger. I think they're, they're bigger than a bigger Suburban, than yes. Uh, and, of course, they're much, much lower. Uh, they're about 55, uh, 56 inches tall and, and uh, much, uh, much differently proportioned as passenger cars, so very different from what we see on the roads today. But these were definitely the biggest ever coming off the American assembly lines, or any assembly line for that matter. And uh, after this, it was time to slim them down a little bit. It's never been replicated, so I think you said it well. It's big car, largest, I mean, the Olds 455 went away in, after 1976, and then the biggest Oldsmobile V8 was the 403 engine that you could get for a few yeah. years after that. What we have to also remember is that these cars really were conceived in an era when American social, technological, political prowess and, and the general mood was perhaps at its peak and it was the time of the moonshot. These were conceived in the late 1960s. The sky was literally the limit or not the limit anymore. And then when these cars came to market in the early 70s, in the fall of 1970, things were starting to change already a little bit. The EPA was uh, started, the environmental awareness, uh, the movement uh, for environmental awareness was beginning to take shape. The whole sentiment and the, and the mindsets of people were starting to 
change a little bit and these cars were actually launched right into an era when things like safety awareness, environmental and, and clean air awareness and uh, these cars were actually conceived um, for the first time really with a fully integrated crash worthiness concept in mind. So front crash, side impact, these all have side impact beams, they have uh, fairly good performance with this crumple zone it shouldn't be any surprise but <laughs> that's one of the reasons why they're so excessively huge is they were designed with with crash worthiness in mind which the cars until 1970 really weren't i mean they yes crash tests were done safety research was done but this is probably the first fruit of that effort uh, on the road and they actually do crash rather surprisingly well and i know that because uh, there was an interesting little thing in germany many years ago where the german technical inspection agency the infamous tüv they inaugurated a new facility and to celebrate this new safety facility that, that they had opened they crashed a 1975 coupe de ville into an <laughs> offset barrier at 35 or 40 miles an hour How, i haven't seen that How did it uh, this was some well? years ago we have to find i haven't seen it lately on the internet either but it was about maybe 10 years ago and the de ville did surprisingly well okay. the hardtops were phased out in anticipation of rollover laws uh, the 1976 el dorado uh, convertible was supposedly the, the last, last convertible yes. in anticipation of safety regulations that would make convertibles impossible. None of this really materialized, but it was an anticipatory mood where the car companies started to pull um, the various body styles that were not conducive to good crash worthiness, like having no B pillars, for instance. So uh, the colonnade roof style, your 1973 Cutlass, on which you already did the segment which was supposed to be an attempt to make it palatable to the public that was used to hardtops to have something that has fixed B pillars again. They sort of created these hybrid body styles of which this one is already creeping towards a little bit by moving the pillars further forward and into a place where you could theoretically incorporate roll bars in an area that would provide some protection. Uh, that never fully came to pass, but at least in the con conceptual phase, these cars were at least conceived with that idea in mind. And of course, they were conceived with airbags in mind, which is another interesting point that these cars represented. These were the first cars where a large-scale field trial of airbags was actually conducted in 1974 and 5. And uh, the instrument panel that these cars have was changed to accommodate that airbag. So we can talk about this in a little more detail later. All right, so let's start with my 75 Olds Delta 88 Royale. I'll do a brief walk around of the vehicle, and then, Mark, you can talk about some of the different design features because there certainly are many uh, unique things for this vehicle. But Absolutely. I really love this car because, as Mark was saying, it's the last of the breed. I mean, it's still huge. It's not as big as his 98, but it does still have the toothpick A-pillars, and I do enjoy that it still is a hard top as opposed to the Chevrolet and the Cadillac that were no longer really true hardtops and didn't have that rear mm -hmm. window that rolled down. So you still get the toothpick A-pillars, the hardtop, and you do have, uh, I also love the fact that this one doesn't have a vinyl roof and that it's black. That's a very unique feature on your car because very, very few vehicles were not equipped with a vinyl top. And uh, that certainly makes yours extremely special. Maybe talk about this uh, molding here, Mark. The, <laughs> This I don't want to talk about this molding. It's a terrible <laughs> molding, but an interesting point that happens on all these cars is this was the full-size interpretation rendition of the colonnade style. And the colonnade referred to an architectural style, you know, with these columns around a, a porch-like, uh, a southern uh, sort of a plantation building, right? This sort of old... Um, columned walkway around a house, a porch, and it had, the colonnade refers to this sort of pillar-like, uh, or, or column-like pillar here in the middle of the car, placed in such a way as if it was an architectural overhang or an eave, and that's why they called them the colonnades, you know, it's arched uh, columns, uh, basically was the architectural motif. And then what they did is um, they put these very styled windows with these big round you know, corners, the radius off corners in it. And on these cars, there's already some very painfully evident cost cutting in of place. Of course, because which I love as a finance the, person. As a finance person. And you yes. can, look how lovely this, this uh, peels away here from the, from well, the radius. Well, it's dynamic art, It's I dynamic would say. art. Yes. It's already yellowed and, and stained because this is plated plastic. It's just like of, copper and no. how it weathers, you know, over time, right? 
if you want to uh, tell you that that's what it is, you're <laughs> welcome to it. But yes, yeah, so you can see the difference between a stamped metal piece and the plastic here. And on your hood, the windshield still has two metal or three metal pieces: the belt line molding, the fender molding, and on the on the hood, you have this piece of stainless here connecting on my car. That center piece of stainless is very much stained plastic. So these are all the little nifty little cost cutting uh the details. centerpiece here yeah, is plastic. the centerpiece you can see it's discolored relative to the uh, bright metal next to it so you see um little details are sneaking in whether we're taking money out it is amazing that they thrifted it each year but i'm guessing because yeah. of inflation you know and probably yes what yes. was happening and, and, and every year there was the pressure on to take some money out of the car and w later on when we talk a little bit about the regency and its inception there are some interesting uh, anecdotes to tell about that but from a design point of view the the 71 through 76 Oldsmobiles were interesting especially the full size in that they had a very very beautiful sculptural feature called the the skeg line which is this crease here at the lower of the body and you can probably see it a little better on the my white car because it's hard to read on a black car it's a basically like a flare or a fin like form that delineates the lower body and flares around the wheel openings. On the 98 you have, uh, of course, a covered wheel opening in the back. Um, That's right, you have the skirted wheel. You get the skirts and on the 88 they were only an optional feature but the car was not promoted with them. But you could get them. And you see how the form around the wheel opening is deliberately sucked out and creates actually a very beautiful play of reflections and transitions which was a styling theme that was tried on many, many cars, especially in the 1960s. And this is a bit of a remnant of that playful form development that was so typical of 1960s cars. And then Chrysler kind of copied that in, the, in that uh, uh, New Yorker brome. Yes, and the, the 74s. 74s yes. When they were, yeah, this was a very, very um, often repeated pattern when you wanted to add interest and also a little bit of structure to the lower body side. What it does to these cars is very interesting and kind of annoying and you wash your cars yourself <laughs> it creates an enormously deep undercut section from here to here it's almost impossible to reach down here so and then also when you try to get the skirt off for a tire change or anything like that is actually very inconvenient and the other problem that that occurs with that is you've get a lot of uh, stone picking and a lot of uh, damage to the paint finish from uh, kicking uh. up gravel and and, and road debris which uh, is typical that on these cars, the rust usually started in the areas where there was a lot of that damage from, from kicking up the road gravel. Now what's going on with the cathedral style taillights in the 98, kind of the Cadillac-esque theme Yes, there? so the 98 was the culmination of a very peculiar marketing strategy by the various GM divisions that started in the early 1960s, where Buick and Oldsmobile were directly and aggressively targeting Cadillac. And it started in the early 60s with a Buick Electra 225, the Oldsmobile LS, the, you know, the luxury sedan that was in, I believe it was 1963, 64 time frame. They became uh, very, very Cadillac-like in their mm. appointments and also in the marketing. And even in the advertising, they refer to it as one of the three or four premier luxury vehicles on the market today, ignoring Lincolns or, or Imperials <laughs> at really hinting at Cadillac and it was a time when GM was very much still a company that was a big umbrella or corporation that had separate car companies under one roof but the separate car companies acted as such they acted as separate car companies yes they were under one corporate umbrella but the they had their own silos and they were very much competing with themselves with which later on then of course became one of the problems that led to GM's you know, constant restructuring in the later 1970s, 80s, and 90s because it was really not an organically grown car company but an accumulation of different uh, companies and brands that really weren't um, competing so much with outside companies but right. they were competing mm -hmm. with, with themselves internally. I do love the detail. It says 98 there in the middle yes. of the taillight. And these yeah. have the rubber fender extensions too that I've talked about. Well, but these have been replaced. These have been replaced, redone. Uh, 
they are problematic because of the plasticizers that were used in them. They were the, the infamous Endura bumpers that were introduced in the late 1960s and then later on the same similar chemical formulations were used to make these bumper fillers and, and, and fender extensions to uh, make the gaps between the steel part of the bumper and the metal of the body flexible to allow for five mile per hour deflection of the bumper. There are massive heavy pistons and shock absorbers in the, in the frame structure to let the bumpers deflect so all this is supposed to deform and right. an impact and then spring back. It's interesting the 88 doesn't have that. These are the 88 metal. has okay. a flexible piece here. Right. This is a plastic piece here. Right. So these are actually metal caps. So the regulations allow for variations. The displacement is here and it's supposed to prevent damage to the metal here. I see. And uh, the other thing here, this is a, a fiberglass cap or is it a metal cap? I'm not quite sure. How it, I, I don't think know, it might be a metal honest. cap on these. Sometimes they were fiberglass. So it, the whole target, the whole goal was to prevent metal damage, to prevent expensive body shop builds. And that was the insurance requirement at the time when the five mile per hour bumper regulations were written to prevent damage to the essential lighting and safety equipment and to prevent expensive body damage. You have so much tumble home on these cars too that then went away yes. with the next generation. That maybe yes, these cars had a lot of glass angle. So the glass barrel is rather extreme. The roof panels are much narrower than the body side and there's an enormous amount of ro uh, room inside yeah. of these cars. It's actually wasted. We can demonstrate that later. Take a look at how the roof panel, as Mark is saying, is so much narrower than the midsection of the body. and then. That, that went away with the next generation on that 77 downsizing. Well, you have to because you wanted to maintain the same interior spaciousness. So, you, and since the cars got narrower, they got a little bit taller and the angle of the glass, the glass barrel itself, uh, got a little less severe in terms of its, its uh, sweep. Uh, that's the only way you could maintain head and shoulder room in these cars, the downsized cars later on. These have enormously wide uh, hip and shoulder room dimensions that are actually quite useless because you really can never use them. Uh, and and uh, we can uh, demonstrate a few things uh, in a minute here that show how uncoordinated some of these dimensions actually were. They really were uh, beyond huge and unnecessarily large. And the B bodies that were downsized for 77 prove that you can get an equally roomy and comfortable interior, if not better by more intelligently arranging those dimensions versus these cars, which are just excessively huge in every dimension. Well, it is shocking how much, I mean, you have a decent sized passenger compartment, but compared to the overall size of the car, there's so much now hood and so much shadows trunk. on the car. Okay, good. That's better. There's so much hood and so much yeah. trunk, you know, in this side view, you can see the skeg line very well that, uh, fades in at the front of the front wheel opening. Ah, it's yeah, a very right crisp there. line here. It blends out right there, kicks out picks up again and basically defines the lower third of the body side. And what this does is, other than being an interesting shape, it also further slims the vertical, the perception of vertical height on, on the body side. So it makes an already extremely long car look even longer. These were all devices, just like the fender skirts in the back. Wow. To uh, visual, uh, visual devices used to make excessive length look even more excessive. Now the 88 that. doesn't have such a pronounced uh, It actually has it? in the front. It's just because of the color. You it's cannot just the see color. It, but it's the same. Okay. You can see it with yes. the reflections in this view. It's, it's roughly the same. Yeah. And you can also see how much of a a cavity it creates on the rear wheel well. Um, if you look at the, uh, the position of the tire and wheel relative to the wheel opening in this three-quarter view, you can basically see, you can play a movie inside of this wheel housing, <laughs> basically. <laughs> it is interesting. Your car and mine both have the cornering lights, too. Yes, that was uh, one of those safety regulations and that was turned into a feature was cornering lamps that of course turn on and illuminate the side of the road when you turn your turn signal on uh, to the respective direction. That was actually a very useful feature. I missed them a little bit on modern cars. Some modern cars have some iterations of them, but uh, I, I find them quite effective. They actually help see the curb and, and the side of the road at night when you're making a turn into a dark area. 
and it's interesting the 98 doesn't have i'm trying to think did they ever have the grill going beneath the bumper on the 98s no because of i think in the earlier years they did because it was very similar to, I mean, that's right 71 yeah. to correct yeah, I the think. the differences were just uh just uh, in the grill texture and some of the details but for the most part the uh the 88 and the 98 had the same basically the same front and clip with the exception of the set of the grill textures but uh, the 76 already was a sort of a portent of things to come because it was trying to combine the early 70s styling with the crisper sheer look that was started with the Cadillac Seville and then subsequently applied to the entire B body generation in 77 and on so this 76 is a little bit out of harmony in, to my eye I found it interesting because I wanted a 70s boat with a uh, poofy uh, velour interior. <laughs> Hence the uh, just, Regency. Exactly. I just like that idea of this bordello on wheels, just this kind of stupidity and taste, this this I never <laughs> apocalypse in <thought> <laughs> good taste, basically. I never thought of that, though, but you're right. The, the headlights in particular kind of yes, this is suggest like the, Seville. the next generation and the Seville. Indeed. And it's a little out of harmony, but I, I, for the longest time, I liked this the least about the car, but now I'm beginning to like it because of its quirky sort of historical... A comment it makes where they're trying to blend these two aesthetic directions together where the sheer look cars that the 77 certainly have in droves and the Seville had right with this more organic softer shape of the early 1970s but you certainly have some of the coolest wheel covers too these uh... yeah that's the thing that a lot of Oldsmobile fans love is these uh, very iconic uh, wheel discs these uh, yeah, these wheel covers very simple on this car, but very tasteful. There's a lot of things about the Regency, in spite of my earlier comment about the apop apocalypse and good taste. They're actually quite nicely done in terms of the detail execution, and we can look at some of these things when we talk in more detail about the Regency. Now, what are your feel thoughts on the wire wheel covers here? Is this a I'm not a fan of, of wire wheel covers. Um, but they are original equipment to the car. You can get them. You can choose between a whole, I think about a half dozen or so wheel cover styles were available they in the catalog. Lot, you're right. And uh, they, they, uh, they were always shown at the back of the brochure. And uh, that was one of the fun things to do is pick out the different trim combinations that people did, including the wheel covers. I'm personally not a huge fan of wi uh, fake wire wheel covers. I'm not even the real ones. Uh, I prefer the ones that are on the 98, but uh, there are other options, and on your car it looks particularly interesting because it is so devoid of any of the other trim enhancements. No vinyl top, no additional bright work. It just has the the thick body side molding and these fake wire wheel covers. <laughs> well, very good. Well, let's pivot now and talk a little bit more about the Regency itself. Well, thanks for watching part one of this series comparing my 1975 Olds 88 with Mark's Olds 98 Regency. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, and also hit the super thanks button, which you can find at the bottom right of your YouTube video viewer. And feel free to email me at rareclassiccars.yahoo.com. Until the next video, be sure to check out some of the video thumbnails at the bottom left and right for suggestions for you. And be sure to subscribe by clicking the circular icon of the 67 Buick Riviera at the top left. Thanks again for watching, and take care.